facing. Well, last week's episode, I got to meet a pretty special guy. His name was John Kuhn. He's well respected and a very talented rigger. He just happened to be coming through our marina the same day that we were here. He was here less than a day and he offered to come over to our boat, put on all his gear, fly up the rig, and inspect it. It was so much information to take in. It was a pleasure to listen to him speak. So today I'm going to go over some of his findings and talk about the suggestions he has for us on what we could do to make our boat more efficient and safer. When the Terralani 5 pulled into the fuel dock, we all took notice. I mean, Teal, Emma, and I wanted to see this boat up close and personal. So we headed down to the field dock and John and his crew were so gracious and inviting. They had us come right on over to give a quick tour. So while we were touring this beautiful boat, John had casually mentioned if he had time that he would come over and check us out. Never in our wildest dreams did we actually believe he was going to do it because really his time is really precious. They were only in for a few hours and you know he's busy. He has a big journey ahead of him. So we headed back to basic and worked on our own projects because you know I mean it was a nice day. And after about an hour and a half we looked up and there is John and Eric at the end of the dock heading towards us. And it's a long dock and it felt like a scene out of a movie. You know when everything kind of slows down and you can almost hear the music. Kind of like in Top Gun, one of my favorite movies, where the fighter pilots are walking towards you in all their gear. It was just awesome. Okay, the first thing John did was threw on his gear and went to the top of the mast. We had to uh, winch him up. Well, actually, there wasn't much winching to do. He climbed up, for the most part, by himself. It was amazing how fast he scrambles up a mast. He's done this a time or two. And what I noticed was that he was not only looking at the rig, but he was feeling the rig. And that was the impressive part to me. He would get to a position on the mast and he went from the top down and he would grab a stay or a shroud and just shake it and shake the rig violently to see how the tube reacted. And he could tell by that what needed to be adjusted or added or subtracted from the rig. It was uh, quite an interesting scene and the noise that came out of this when he, when he would uh, start violently shaking uh, the rig was intimidating. Oh my goodness, the noise was so loud. Like, Compass and I were in the salon and it felt like the mask was just going to fall right through the ceiling. Once John was on board, he was ready to go right up the mast. And the last thing that we wanted to do was to pick up the camera and film it because here is a man of expertise willing to donate his time and knowledge to inspect our rig. So, you know, it just felt disrespectful to do that to him. And it wasn't until about an hour into his inspection that we asked him if we could film some of it. And he said yes. After John left, I immediately went to my tablet and took as many notes as I could. I reviewed some of the footage and wanted to make sure I retained as much of that information as possible. He threw a ton of stuff our way and I wanted to heed his advice. There was about, well actually there was five big takeaways I got from our meeting and I'll go over those five items right now. I guess the first thing he mentioned and we knew this, and we've been putting it off. Um, and it hurt a little to hear, but we knew it had to happen. Replace the boom. You know, he didn't go into much detail about the boom, but looking at it, he could tell it was terribly undersized. Even though this boom is 27 years old, it is the original boom from the boat, and it's lasted this long, and it's time for it to retire. 
So he did give us some insight and some contact information for spar manufacturers that he trusts and that he respects. It's a lively little tube. Got a friend in Watsonville that makes nice spars. His name is Buzz Ballinger. And so we'll be approaching those in the next week or so and get some quotes to see what it's going to take to replace this. What's it cost to, if I was to 100% start over on a boat like this for new mast, all re -break. Ballinger spar, Ballinger boom, like yeah, just roughly. That's yeah, out of our budget. Should, 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 <laughs> should be should be about 120. Yeah, I know. It's... Item two on the list was our running backstays, and you know he had some great information for us on how to modify these to get these so they're going to be running uh, more efficiently and putting the right pressure on the mass to get better performance out of our sail plan. It's a, a cold formed okay. press. They're strong, but and it's been in fresh water and it's a lightly loaded thing. So it's not gonna break right away, but when you change that, I would just make, this would all be Spectra. For running the running back, backs? Running backs don't need to be wired. They just chew up sails. Okay. So it'd be nice if it just covered synthetic. No, I agree. And then, then you would just have a, just come down to um, an ice splice, right, with a thimble, and then get your new blocks on. Yeah, and then it'll, with fresh rope, it'll work much nicer. Yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> the next thing we really talked about was eliminating these. They're in the way. They seem to have no function, in his opinion. We slacked them as much as we can, and his suggestion was to uh, get the main up and run with these in the slack position and see how the mass performs, see how it breathes. And if we could live without them, to actually put check stays at the second spreader that will tie back into our, our runners back here. Yeah, that, that's an easy improvement. And then if you felt you needed these, again, I'd just make them check stays right off the I'd like that idea. spreaders. I, I like that idea. Yeah, just... Play if I'm if I'm replacing this, might as well check stay yeah. it to that position. Yeah, and then the way to do that again is that just bring them both to a, a delta plate, and then just fine tune the length of this one just with spectral lashing. Right. That way it's all software. Right. And you can even make that delta plate out of UHMW or something that so there's no metal up there. You know something. Right. So you're you don't if you forget to ease your runners, you don't chew up your sails on it. Right. Right. Or if you just don't have time to do it. Right. You know, I talked to John about synthetic versus wire for us and which direction we should go. And he was not real excited about going all synthetic with us. There is a place for it though. There is a few areas that synthetic works on our boat. And he likes the idea of synthetic if it's near a place a sail rubs on a stay or a shroud. In the case of our, our runners back here, synthetic is the way to go because it does get close or may rub on our main along with those check stays so the idea was to have the check stays and this runner here all synthetic run down to a new block lead down and over to a big winch right here that way we could put the appropriate uh, pressure on that check stay and uh, running aft stays a neat idea I love it and you know I had an idea of putting a winch here regardless and that's why I put this big radius on the deck and then a lot of people when they're really dependent on the runners they get away from the block and tackle to a jammer they'll just take it to its own um, winch that way you can really fix the length it's hard to really get much of a reliable consistent strain with tackle but it's all this boat needs right well, I do want to put two other winches here, and I can certainly run these. Oh, that would be so sweet. Yeah. Like right there? Yeah, right here. Oh, that right would there be a dream. There. So your runner well, and your check stay would come to their own winch. And right. With those check stays installed, what we'd really need, in his opinion, is an inner stay. And that would run from the middle spreader up here down to in this position here. And he says putting a, a high field lever to make it a removable stay would be the way to go. After all, we do have a working jib. So this stay 
would only be used when we're on long tacks. And what it'll do is uh, create that bow in the center of the mast that'll give that right shape to the mast to make our main perform better. Guaranteed an interstate, like a sincere interstate. And then you'll, you'll sail with a lot more peace of mind, for sure. And that's synthetic as well, you're saying? Why not? You're not going to hank a sail on it. Right. And, and it's not any. And how do you put tension than this. on that? Just a block and tackle at the bottom? How do you tension it? Sure. Sure. Or a, a high field lever. Right. If you have oh, yeah. a fixed length. Yeah. Just to, yeah, I got you. Because block and tackle, sometimes it's hard to get enough tension on it. Like right. if you really want to constrain the behavior of the mast. It'd be great if you if it was like when you threw the lever up, right. it was the length right. that put the, the positive pre-bend in the tube. Right. And that was the end of the conversation. And what's that going to do for the head sail? Is it going to slack that head No, stay? the head stays controlled by the back stays. Okay. So you're, you're just going to take the middle section, the middle panel of the mast, and give it a positive pre-bend the way they like to be. And then what'll, what'll happen then is, is it, when, you're, when you're sailing deep reefed and powered up, your leech won't be dragging the center of the mast back. Right. I bet you when you're sailed this, sailing this reef, that mast gets deeply inverted. Right. Another thing is, is if you have an inner stay to um, uh, uh, cause a positive pre-bend, then when you put the runners on, you're actually going to control the top of the mast head better. Because right now, when you pull those back, the whole mast, it, the mast would love to continue inverting into a buckle this way, right? It's the nature of a column, right, right? Right. So when you tighten these, you're actually putting more negative inversion into them just due to plain old compression. Right. You're but, like it's like a bow. Yeah. So, but if you but if you have an inner stay that that checked that negative movement when you loaded the runners, it would actually let it would bring the mast head back, so and it would help push the midsection forward to some extent. Especially with a heavy load on the main. Right? Cantilever it and you know to some extent it would depower the main. Another thing we talked about was really exciting to me and it was adding a light wind sail. Adding a pole off of our bow and running a screecher or code zero and leading it aft. That to me is what we really need. You know, our jib here, our new 90% jib, it's a great sail, but it's not gonna do it in ultra light winds. That's where that screecher or code zero is gonna come in handy. Because I wanna put tracks here with, uh, with a jammer. I wanna put a code zero uh, on here that off a screecher, sweet. and it'll run off that and then actually block over to these positions. Let's get started. There's some witches over there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So the big takeaway from this whole meeting was we knew we needed to, you know, obviously modify this rig. It's an older rig, but some of the things he said was encouraging. I think he really got a kick out of uh, flying up her mast and looking how this boat has been put together. You know, this isn't the original mast that was on our boat and to make this mast work, uh, the rigger had to get creative and John could appreciate that Some of the things he thought were innovative some things he got a kick out of some things he flat out uh, giggled at so It was a good time it was insightful and you know, we're gonna take his advice on Everything he said because these are items that we knew were issues items that we knew we had to take care of and it felt good to have somebody like John come on board and just confirm our original thoughts. So our next step is now Teal is going through and looking at everything that we need and I'm talking making a list of all the parts, evaluating the condition that what we have currently is in and just taking stock of what we need in order to get this all together. It's a lot to take in and you don't really realize how much 
you have to have in order for one thing to pull together. It's not just like buying a boom and just slapping it on and calling it a day. There's a lot more to it than that. Once Teal gets the list down, then I come in and do my work. I absolutely love doing the research and resourcing, trying to source out where we're gonna get these items. You know, it's some of these things you can buy at the marine store ready-made, but there are other things that it's gonna take a little time. You're gonna have to have that special customized and made for you. So, you know, we have to figure all that out. Once we get all the pricing down, then we have to set our budget. Yes, we set budgets for ourselves. Anybody that says that they don't have a budget, you're lying. I mean, we're all human and this is gonna be a huge and kind of spendy project. So we budget for everything that we do. Once that budget is set, then we break down all of our projects what we need and can do right now. Some of these items will take time to place the order and, and just figure out when it's gonna be coming in. You know, the boom is not ready made. These are made special for your boat and it's designed for your boat. So that can take up to four weeks, we don't know. So it's, it's a lot and then Aside from that, you know, now that spring and summer is near and the weather's getting better, we're going to be on the move. Any time that there's a nice weather window, we're going to be taking the opportunity to sail down the coast, which means logistics wise, we have to plan where our orders are going to be coming in. We're not going to order everything all at once and just carry that on board. So since we've left Port Townsend, I have been trying to anticipate and plan all of Teal's projects. So when we go into a port, I want to make sure that we have the parts. I want to make sure that it's been ordered if it's something that takes a little bit longer. So imagine placing an order and not having an actual address. So that has been a struggle, but it hasn't been too bad. My main, I guess, advice to anyone that's doing this is get to know the port and marina. Get to know the personnel there. They can be your best friends. I have called ahead, introducing ourselves and letting them know that we're gonna be there. And maybe I'm going to ship something over there to them. They usually keep it really safe for us and it just gives us that much more of a connection. <sighs> There's a lot to take in. And my brain already hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a productive day and I think it's time for us to unwind and what I mean by unwinding is just having some family time over a meal and just relaxing just kind of taking it in of what we've done it's a balancing act when it comes to boat projects and family life because you know you gotta have a little bit of both so our biggest thing is after dinner and you guys know that food is really important to me is we sit back and play a card game or we do a board game and most recently with movies we watch a lot of movies not only do I love movies I love my sitcoms and it's so funny because since we've left Seattle, there's been really no TV for us. So we've been really creative in trying to find things that we all are really interested in. One of the things is, as we've uh, gone into ports, we've done a little research to find movies that have been filmed in those areas. First in Port Townsend, there's The Officer and a Gentleman. We had to watch that. And then in Port Angeles, there was Return to Red October. And that was really interesting. Then of course, La Push, we went and watched, or we watched uh, the Twilight series. So now that we're in Astoria, obviously there's been a lot of movies that have been filmed in this area, but did you know that the Goonies house is just right up the street from us? So tonight we're gonna be watching the Goonies and having a meal. So if you watched our previous video, you'll understand that we are carnivores.
Actually, we're omnivores. But we are right in the middle of Lent, and it is Friday, so we do not eat meat. Tonight, I'm going to be making crab mac and cheese. This is all the ingredients I have on board already. It sounds decadent. Well, it kind of is. But this is crab that Emma and Teal caught locally, and I have a freezer full of it. So why not indulge? Say crab mac and cheese. No, I said I wasn't gonna say that. Mm. Let's eat. Stop. Mm. That looks delicious. Let's eat. Now it's time for the movie. Thanks for watching this week's episode of Onboard Lifestyle. If you like our videos, please give us a thumbs up and share our channel with your friends and family. A special thanks goes out to our patrons. Without them, these videos would not be possible. You know, it was perfect timing for us to meet John at this stage of our project, and he gave us so much valuable information to improve our rig. So come back next week to see how we progress. See you then. <laughs>